call this meeting to order. I think it's 7 o'clock. And we will start with our roll call. Yes, Stiles. Here. Sims. Here. Bozell. Here. Abraham. Here. Also present is Jessica Brockman uh, from Coolidge Wall and Village Planner, East Swing. Great. Um, let's review the agenda. Do we have anything to change to add? I was wondering maybe, because since we have a lot of things on the agenda, if we might want to talk about the air bed and breakfast before we talk about pocket neighborhoods. Would that be okay with folks? Yeah, that's okay. Yes, just, thank you. That's your name. Just in case we don't have any light. Okay, um, and we'll now review the minutes. So we'll go page by page. Any changes to the first page? Okay. How about the second page? Any changes? Any changes to the third page? The fourth? from Charlene Prestopino and Carl Champney. Okay. Um, I want to start by saying that um, I, in talking with the um, superintendent over the streets, one of the things he has as a goal is to uh, eventually compile a listing of all of these alleys that are no longer being used um, by the public that have structures on them, trees, grass, and they maintained by the property owners. Um, and, and in the case of both of these alley vacations, that is exactly the situation. Um, the first one, um, <clears throat> Charlene Prestepino and Carl Champney um, are getting ready to uh, remove uh, an old structure, accessory structure on their property and are planning to replace that with a, with a new uh, garage. Um, when, uh, in looking at the alley on that, um, they had assumed that it had already been vacated, and um, when they had their uh, surveyor take a look at it, um, and after talking with me, he contacted Green County Recorder's office, and it's never been officially vacated. So in order for them, they actually own the little parcel on the opposite side of the alley, so in order for them to have the setback that they need, um, 
they need to incorporate that as well. And so they're going to go ahead and what we're asking for on this alley vacation is all the way up to only to the part that they own, um, not the the property um, that abuts them uh, owned by, uh, well, it's parcel 105 and parcel 104 on High Street, which you can see from the photo. Do you have the yeah. mm -hmm. exhibit? Exhibit, uh, exhibit. Yeah, Exhibit A actually shows their the names, um, but Exhibit B hopefully shows, shows, the, the, shows the yeah the section that's highlighted mm -hmm. in that pink is what is being put that uh, requested for vacation. And you see, um, if you can see on that, um, well, obviously you really can't see it. There is actually a shed that crosses over it. There is a photo um, mm -hmm. included, so you can see that that is not being used for public access. Uh, procedurally, once this is approved uh, by Planning Commission, it has to go for a first and second reading by ordinance uh, through Village <coughs> Council. And then after that process, after 30 days after the second reading, um, then um, we can file it as an application with, with the county recorder's office. So now we do the public hearing, right, before we have discussion. Well, you can do either either way. You can discuss first and then open public hearing, or you can go over to the Don't we usually hear from the homeowners? So let's open it to hear from the homeowners, and any, uh, we'll open the public hearing and anyone who else wants to comment. Is there anything that you'd like to say? I think she summed it up beautifully. I, okay. You know, I um, own that property. Can you come to the mic? Oh, sure. I'm sorry, if everybody you'll come to the microphone and, and tell us your name because you're on television. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Charlene Hestby now, and I think Denise did a great job of summing it up. I've lived in that, I've owned the property since 1980, and I've been paying property taxes all this time and just assumed it was the alley since we own the piece on the other side and um, found that out. Mm -hmm. It's crawling through my yard. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Anyone else have any comments? Then we will close the public hearing part. Um, any discussion? Um, I guess I'd just like to say that um, in relation to these uh, alley vacations, I'd really like staff to work on like a comprehensive plan of dealing with the yeah, that that will have to be the superintendent yeah. of the streets to provide me what he feels is adequate. That, thank you yeah. for working on that, and um, that's really. And I see no reason not to do this. Okay, is there would someone like to make a motion? But before you do that, as as part of council, uh, I talked with Denise earlier today, and, and I thank Oswald. It's, it's a great idea. Some of these big places and, and giving them to the people that live there so that they can enjoy the years. <coughs> I just don't, I just wonder if we can do a break to that, but I know we can. Yeah, I'm not really, I don't know, I, I don't think it'll, I mean, sort of, right. but it's going to have to be each individual because right. they'll have to assess if there's any. Um, Sanitary sewer right. yeah. tiles. I mean, electric poles. Right. Yeah, kind of. But kind like, of lay the groundwork for when the people who want their alleys vacated and like do a, you know, have a, a more streamlined process with all the information available. With, you know, knowing that this is going to come up every time. And we might be able to have a list from that of ones that we can go ahead. Yeah, vacate. Mm -hmm. I think that's what you're going to say. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, so we'll be ahead of the process in that manner. Okay. Okay, is there a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Okay. Hold on. Aye. Abraham? Aye. Sims? Yes. Tiles? Yes. Okay. Okay. Congratulations. <laughs> Okay, then our next one, we have another. Um, and now it goes through council twice, right? Yes. Right. Right. So we should, we should be giving these on 40, 
get them on Monday? No, because it's, it's, it's actually an ordinance to vacate, so it's going to take a little bit of time for uh, okay. who okay. to get it written up. Uh, I would say October 3rd is reasonable. Okay. I just want something for them. Yeah. So. And then when, when would the second reading be? October mm -hmm. uh, next meeting? October 17th? Yeah. And yeah. then it's 30 days from then. And, uh, well, it's only if you have a petition. Uh, oh. Yeah. It's a little more complicated. Only if you have a petition, is there a 30 day wait? And they had a petition, but it's um, it's a, yeah, they, they would be able to do it at two different meetings. But then they have a 30 day wait after it's been approved, right? right. Mm -hmm. The village files the county. Okay. Right. And then, and then, well, I filed the alley yeah. vacation. Yeah. yeah. And they'll you file. So that would be what in November. Correct. Okay. Well, then let's move on to our next um, vacation, which is um, right away for Steve Barker and Julia Breiker. This one was a little bit more complicated because, um, sorry. In the process of, uh, they, they were building an, a little studio for their filming, um, it's an office studio, and when they tore down an existing building in an alley that they thought was vacated, um, they found a survey pin underneath the, underneath the And so uh, everybody on the surrounding properties um, on West Center as well as on Senior Avenue had thought, thought the way the boundaries were, were exactly how the properties were platted, but that was not the case. Um, so uh, this is, we're here tonight for an alley vacation. This will also require, uh, during the time that it has to go through the channels of the alley vacation, um, they're also gonna have to come back and um, I'll do like a temporary lot split um, while they, uh, once that's approved, and the alley vacation comes in, then they can go do, and do a replat. And those three properties then will have correct boundaries, which is something that's really, uh, even if it's just a little piece of, the, of that area, that's, good, that's a good thing to have done because we have this problem in a lot more locations where the, the boundaries are not quite right. Anyone have any questions at this point? Or is it over the pins in the room location or the lines on the Why don't you ask them? Okay. Maybe Bryce later. Mm -hmm. This is better for me. Hi, everyone. My name is Steve Bogner, and this is Julie Weckert. We're the owners of the property at 726 Senior Avenue. Um, our house, uh, um, the previous owner was Bill Hooper, and before that, W.W. W. Deaton. And somewhere along the line, someone, perhaps 50 years ago, 75 years ago, maybe older, built a garage in the alley on top of one of the pins. And that garage stood for X number of decades until we tore it down last year. We had fully assumed, our, our deed says that we have all rights to the unopened alley. And we just assumed that meant we owned it. But that's not the case. We, it's, uh, we have all rights to it, but we don't own it. The village owns it. Um, and um, on discovering that pin and realizing our yard was actually much smaller than we thought, uh, and we assumed for 25 years since we moved in the house, we began this process. And Denise has done a very thorough job. Thank you for all of you, because I know it's been a ton of time. It's a learning process for me. <laughs> but, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of very complicated. Yeah, so it's so complicated that, you know, after this alley vacation, they'll have to do a lot split. Once that's been approved, they're going to have to come back and file for a replat. And then um, once that's done, then they can take the replat and take it to Green County and they'll uh, record it for the office uh, official tax map records. But it's going to be a little bit longer of a process. They, they didn't have a petition, so I mean, they're not, they don't have a time restraint anyway, so. 
So at this point, what we're doing is just approving the alley. Just the alley vacation. The other two pieces of that, the lot split and the uh, replant, can be done by by next week. Okay, so let's open this to the public hearing. Is there anybody else who has anything you want to say? Okay, then we'll close the public hearing. Any other comments, questions? Um, have, we, have we heard from Lot 235? Yeah, there should be a letter of support yes. from our... Yes. I, I, there's a lot in here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so our, our property has uh, two neighbors on the corner, and both uh, neighbors have, have agreed fully with mm -hmm. you know, the fact that we would take okay. the alley. And um, okay. there's signing agreements in there. Oh, nice. It's Exhibit C. Okay, yes. Thank you. Yeah, they're going to do a quick claim deed, and then the other property owner is going to let the, he'll be buying a piece of the real estate off of that. Okay, do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, the group. Yes. Abraham. <laughs> <laughs> Aye. Sims. Uh, yes. Silzo? Yes. Stas? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Next is a conditional use application uh, from Eric Clark. This is for an accessory structure um, and then an accessory dwelling unit, which will be up above the accessory structure on the property at 121 East Data Street. Um, and with my findings following the accessory structure and ADU, guide, ADU guidelines, it meets all of the qualifications and the setbacks, the lot coverage as well. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Okay. Anyone have any questions before we open the public hearing? Okay, let's open the public hearing and Eric, if you'd like to talk, or Ted. Hello, my name is Ted Donnell. Um, I'm the architect for Eric. Um, this this structure is actually uh, replacing an existing one-story garage that's on a little bit closer to the house. Uh, the intent is to. Uh, increase the size of the garage uh, for the residents as well as the dwelling in and above for a rental. Um, it fits within the uh, key issues that are in the zoning code relative to <coughs> increasing density within a, a density um, RC district. Um, it's very close to downtown and walkable to the, you could hit the library to the rock. Um, so it's really a good candidate for this infill concept that we've been talking about. It, um, try to address in the new zone code. So, uh, Eric's here. Or, you know, if you want to ask him any questions, then I don't agree with you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, discussion? Uh, can we have a motion to approve? Yeah. Well, I did open it. I need to close it. Yeah. Is there else Anyone else who wants to speak? Okay, then we'll close the public hearing. Any other discussion? Okay, is there a motion to approve? Is there a second? Abraham. Aye. Aye. Yes. 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 Okay, great. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, then 
we have our um, last public hearing piece, the conditional use application for 150 Railroad Street, Ted Dunnell. The, the size of this proposed uh, studio and accessory dwelling unit or rental up residential above is, a, is uh, <clears throat> within the size of an accessory dwelling unit, but yet we are required to have a site plan review. So I have uh, added the site plan review requirements um, to this. I've tried to answer as many of the questions related <coughs> to it. Um, this will be the second time I've had to do a site plan review. Um, so uh, when we do normally in residential areas, you don't have to get this involved in, in, in the size of because of the size of the structure. However, this is a little bit different. This is in B1. Um, it's uh, which allows for a uh, non-residential space on the uh, street level floor with a residential dwelling unit on the second floor. And this is what is being proposed. And I think that probably Mr. Bernal can explain it as far as getting to the details. If you want to go through any parts of this. Um, is it the difference in the zone that they're on that this application needs a site plan review and the other one we just approved doesn't? Right. Okay, because that was in RC. Yeah. And this is in <coughs> B. All right. You, um, accessory dwelling units um, are not permitted in B1. As like over a garage. What, what is permitted is what you see throughout the downtown is a store <laughs> on the bottom level and then a, a residential. So why is this property zone being one? Well, that might be a question for <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a yes, it is, correct? I mean, the, the other houses on Railroad Street are in RC, oh. but, but not this one. Is it, it's the last one on the... It's the end of the parking lot. Yeah. And I bought the property approximately 20 years ago. It was my office, um, my architectural firm for probably 12 to 14 years. Um, at certain points, I had six, seven employees working out of there. Um, I closed my office, became a sole proprietor, uh, rented the house real problems with the rental. Um, my wife and I decided to re remodel it and turn it into our house as a main primary um, <coughs> unit and then I run my home office out of the house. That would be uh, this particular structure for a rental unit above what would be a studio, an art studio um, for myself. So it has commercial use to it, which fits into the B1 district, but it is kind of odd. I mean, the, the B1 district zoning section really applies to things like downtown. They yeah. don't apply to this little outskirt property. <laughs> uh, these issues would happen on some of the properties on the, I guess, the north side of Walnut mm -hmm. that are in the B1 district also. So there are, you know, exceptions. Um, I think that's why they're conditional uses anyway. I don't think that it does anything in terms of uh, not fitting in all the key principles <coughs> of the intent of the zoning and the district. Um, I'm just, I'm sort of, I'm wondering why we have residential, I mean, like, properties in B1. Like, why did we, why is it, why are there properties, you know, like, down, you mean like at a home? Yeah. Um, well, that's an interesting question. I did look into that, um, and I found there's probably a little less than a dozen like that. Um, the uh, the what, east side of uh, South Walnut, next to the corner cone, that row of houses mm -hmm. are all in B1. Um, 
there's a the house on Glen Street, but it's being used. Um, is is that used. just historically always been? I don't. Well, I during the so we could rewrite what yeah. we were trying to do is expand the Beatman district. Yeah. Okay. So, and in terms of doing that, it gives all of those residential users an opportunity to actually conduct yeah. the building. Opportunity, but also there are some, you know, Well, in terms of converting it to a business, to a residence to a business, that's yeah. permitted yeah. in B1, yeah. where it's not in RC. So Obviously. it's an advantage on that level. This yeah. just happens to be one of those goofy things where the accessory dwelling unit is an exception and I doubt anybody else in the B1 district would do. Yeah. And because of the way the lots are configured. Yeah, this is a larger lot. Yeah, it's a very big lot. This particular um, property has an ease has a right of way easement would so so the the people that are living in the upper dwelling unit would not have to access Railroad Street. Correct. They can come in off of David Street. There's actually a, a 12 foot, uh, 15 foot, well, it's, it's, an access it's like 12 here. feet on the, on the one path. <laughs> and That's there used to be a garage there that faced, I mean, literally is in the same juxtaposition mm -hmm. as the proposed when it faced that alley Business in the at the street level. 
Would a change of business have to come back to Planning Commission in any event? A change of use? Um, it might. I don't want to, it might. I don't want to say for sure. Um, lots okay. of times change of use, if it's just retail or retail or what, I, you know. Okay, yeah, so if it's not yeah, a certainty, then yeah, that makes a lot of sense to put it into the motion. Mm -hmm. yes. <clears throat> so we want someone to make a motion with that if there is a change of use, that that's a that's a parking be reevaluated. Okay. <clears throat> that you're allowing that you allow you allow the parking as with the, the three spaces, but with the change of use, um, change of occupancy, change of use, um, that would need to be reevaluated. Okay. I uh, make a motion to uh, accept. Um, staff's recommendation to approve the application with the condition that if um, it's necessary to uh, reevaluate the parking with a change of use, then that be done. Okay. Did you want change of use or change of occupancy? That's or a change of use slash change of occupancy. Okay. Okay, we've got that. Second. Hold on. Uh, yes. Sims. Yes. Abraham. Yes. Stout? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Moving along. And, and with, with that, I'd like to excuse myself since we completed yes. the formal portion. Because I know the committee will be hearing about it. Anything that regulates 
daily? <coughs> No, not really, no. I didn't understand. When I saw the short term, we talked about the short term rental unit when I brought this up last time, but we were kind of thinking that it really didn't fit. But but then I'm looking at it again. I'm thinking if it's leased to one person, one family. And so short term rental units are conditionally allowed in all, in all of these except for? Yeah, before you could only have it in like the downtown business areas, and that's why when they did the zoning code, they decided to put in this language for short-term rentals. Have we had anyone apply for a conditional use for, for short-term short rentals? rentals? No. Okay. But we have some down. What do we have, six, eight? Oh, well, I'm, I'm getting people calling in saying, you know, that they're, they're questioning it because yeah. all of a sudden Airbnbs are popping up next door. Yeah. I are our, our current bed and breakfast covered under the short term rental? Oh, no, we have completely different. So, so why wouldn't these be considered under, under the same rules as bed and breakfast? As bed and breakfast, because bed and breakfast, there's very strict rules. Right, that's what I was wondering. Because I know that bed and breakfast in town, you have to reside at the property. Yeah, right, and with the Airbnb, you might just, it's like a, you might do a vacation. I know local spot. people, yeah, who, who have Airbnbs who don't. Well, I was just the house all, like, all the time, you know. So I was wondering if, if there was any reason as to why um, that is permitted and that is not for bed and breakfast, and what the why there is this. I mean, I mean, I, I can just see that. Like, I mean, I know, like, uh, just like you know, Uber and bed and breakfast is looked as seen as by a lot of people in like existing industries as sort of uh, easy way. To, I mean, it, it basically is sort of like killing the you know short term rental industry outside of um, you know your bed and breakfast, like Uber is doing with taxis. Uh, so I was just curious as to why it would be easier to do an Airbnb versus a regular bed and breakfast. If there's any reason behind that, or if it needs to be. Well, is it because of the, 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 uh, I mean, the bed and breakfast is usually multiple rooms, and it and there's you really have to have quite a bit of parking, and it's, a it's just not going to fit in just any house. Yeah. Right, but I mean, I, 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 I mean, I, I know people have their whole houses as their bed and breakfast, yeah. and there's people and there's houses very similar sizes that are. Bed and breakfast in town too. Well, I would that, that? Yeah, I mean, it seems like anyone who had a B and B could be like, well, it's actually a short-term rental unit, right? And then everything just gets easier. Well, there's okay. There's already a section on. There's a conditional use section on bed and breakfast. Yeah, but so now the short short-term. I didn't understand where the short-term rentals came from. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what? When someone would be, is it self-determined that this is a short-term rental unit? This is a and b Like, if I opened up a b and b and was like, wanted a conditional use for a short-term dwelling unit, a short-term rental unit, like, what would stop me from, is that your question? Yeah, I, I, I just see, I mean, I see like the, the in, in reality, the differences being very, very minimal, but on paper there, it seems like a totally different process and experience and what's allowed is, is very very different uh, so i'm just curious as to well and that's why i feel like we whatever we do we gotta make sure we we really because i mean i, I know there's been issues with a better breakfast or multiple better breakfast people in town who aren't happy with the way certain things were going and i, mean, I just see like this as being like with you know, the way what was going just just like the way, the way that they're regulated, they're regulated um the restrictions and the rules you know how to do Design at the property. They felt that the bed and breakfast were going Yeah, I just see the the having like the, the not being allowed. I mean, you having to reside at your property with, at a bed and breakfast versus at an Airbnb. You don't have to. I see that as being like a huge, you know. That's one. I think I think with uh, bed and breakfast, you basically get breakfast, and right. then that's it. You don't have cooking in your room. Right. Yeah, but if you don't let, I mean, like you can still be. So is it? Is it just that they're also providing the breakfast? Yeah, I, I, just, I, I, mean, I don't know how, how we're seeing them as two different entities. What, what is the definition of each? What's, what separates the two? Because um, like, if, if they're going to be such... Because such the short-term rental unit to is me, a to dwelling me, the, unit. The Airbnb is no different. If you just take out the length of time, it's no different than a long-term rental. We've never really regulated that here. I mean, we're, you're supposed to do a change of use. If you... If you have a house and you're no longer residing in it and you decide you want to use it for business purposes and rent it, you're supposed to file a change of use with the village and then an occupancy permit is issued by the county. And, but we've never, I mean, people don't, I mean, there's rentals all over this place and have been 
as Antioch being a college town for generations. And you know, that's never been regulated. But the Airbnb is sort of the same thing. The property owner just it's just maybe they're just letting somebody rent it for a few days or uh, or a week or a month. It's, it's but we don't have regulations for a few days. There I mean they're not right. that's totally that's right. allowed. You're right. That's just allowed. I don't it's well, is I don't it allowed know why or is it not allowed? Or is it not allowed? I, I know. Yeah, I, would think, right. I would think it's not allowed since it's not addressed. I, it's not regulated, but but to see then a person could say, well, but they, if something's not regulated, that doesn't mean that it's not allowed. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's what people are doing because there isn't any regulation on it. That's going ahead and, and, and using but it. But it's not. It's I and mean, it's not. It's not not allowed for them to do that. They're just doing it. Yeah, there's no regulation. There's no. I mean. That's not necessarily true. The well, Ohio Building Code does kick in on any resident that is not being used by a single family. But if for we that don't have any regulation on it. Is the village required to enforce the Ohio Building Code? Each individual property owner is required to follow the Ohio Building Code. Legally, yeah. law. But who, who, enforces, who enforces it? The county. The county. Yeah. 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 You know, if, if, so if that's enforced, but I mean, why should we have regulations if the county has regulations on it? Because there is a responsibility to by the village to issue zoning that goes along with any application to the county for a change of use. So the village has to issue a zoning permit before the county will review the documents for a change of use at the county level. And just, just as a simple caveat, if somebody is using a facility or a structure for it not its intended use, they're liable for no insurance coverage. They're illegal. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like driving a car without a license. You know, if you drive a car without a license, your car gets taken away from you and you get hauled off to jail. You know, it's the same thing in a house. If you're using that house it, and it's intended for, to be a single family resident, that's what it's permitted to be used for. Fire codes, all of those things fall so, into play. So I think that if we're rewriting the regulations, we should base it off of what the count, what is needed for county level enforcement. The county doesn't at this point talk about short term rentals and it talks about a rental unit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and if I represent a client, I'm not telling anybody what as long as they're renting it and they're the single owner of that property and they control that property, I don't think that it's it's illegal at that point. You know, because that So when owner, are you saying that it is? The because the, when, it, when it's called a rental unit, then you can rent that unit as long as you are the applicant and you control the rental. And the building code says we see it as a rental unit, and that's how it goes through the code abstract to determine whether or not it's compliant with the Ohio building code. Okay, So that still, it's a change of use. It still would have to get a zoning permit and go through the process with the county to get that change of use. But the, the, what I'm saying is that the building code doesn't go rental unit, Airbnb, short-term rental, one-day rental. It doesn't break it down like that. It yeah. just says that it's a rental unit. Uh, uh, why do we need to break it down? Uh, I think she's saying, why should we have heavy regulation, any more regulation that's already regulated? Is it just asking there's a need for it. Is that yeah. I guess I wonder if there are safety issues that you want to be sure that they're being code, and you want to be sure that they have insurance if something happens. Because you, because as you said, the owners may not be there. And what if something happens while they're gone? Who then takes responsibility? Who does the village contact regarding what's happening there? You said there were, there were calls already about this. What Were, were there were complaints or was it just questions? Some, or, some are inquiries um, about whether or not we have any regulations thinking of doing this and others have been people that have been complaining that this is going on and you know it become especially if you're more congested areas in the community and there's not a lot of parking I, I wondered about that if part of having people registering is so that we look at it
to make sure that you don't have them all in one area or you know and that neighbors I guess would have some input if they were not happy with but, what's going on the other thing I wondered is what is the benefit to our community like a bed and breakfast if they have so many units don't they then pay the hotel tax or they have to pay something and doesn't money then come to the village no, I'm not as happy to be uh, but, but well, I, I know they don't push it to yeah. the bed and breakfast tax. The only one that would apply to the, the hotel taxes. Hotel. Okay. I, I thought it was so many units. If it was yeah. four or five if units, it was over there. five because that's or five or over because that's what the um, Arthur Morgan House agreed to, right? Because mm -hmm. yeah, it was right. only the Arthur Morgan House and Mills Park Hotel who would be um, who that would be applicable to. But but addressing that, I mean. If anyone in the village, right, wanted to rent out their property for any length of period, be it long term or short term, they would need to have a change of use with the county. Is that what you're saying? A change of use with us, but the thing but is, then, but it's not in anybody's mindset to think yes, that they need yes. to do that. No, so I understand. That. But what I'm saying is, like, through that process, if that were to happen, they would come to us, right? If if the regulations were being enforced as they stand they now, would, they would use. they would do a change of use. They would come through us, and we would look at parking, right? So there there could be a you know there is very explicitly you know regulations on different kinds of rental units, right? I mean, it seems like we're just not really explicit about what the requirements are for different kinds of rental units and There's having... one big difference, though, that if, if you own a property, you're permitted to, to own that property and then rent it for its intended use, i.e., if it's a single-family residence, you can rent it as a single-family single residence. Yeah. What happens with the Airbnb is that if it's a single family residence and you're renting out a room. <laughs> that's a dual tenancy. Yeah. So <coughs> but they would have to have a change of use, right? Yes. Yeah. So they would have to come to the <coughs> and then we would But they would but that's yeah, what it would be. But typically a change of use um, may not require a planning commission visits. Yeah, okay. You know, um, okay. it's just that now yeah, to today's. Yeah, I mean but but you don't have any words to tell them. Right. It's just I mean it's like for example, technically every time a business goes out of business downtown and a new business comes in, even if that business is just like the other business, they're supposed to do a change of you. No. I mean why? They, they don't people aren't aware of it. They're, they're not aware of it. No. Why are they required to do a change of use? It's just what the zoning code says. And then that, that, the that, that kicks in Here's to a good the example. If you have a retail business that sells non combustible products and people go into that space, the the occupancy permit talks about what you're selling and classifies it as a hazard, as a certain yeah. hazard. If you go into, if you're a new tenant and you have, let's say you sell candles and you have all these candles lit in your showroom, I'm just making this up, but that becomes a high hazard. And the fire department needs to know when they're walking into a space that has a higher hazard than the original user because they are putting people's lives at risk. So they need to know what is intended in that building so they're not surprised. See what I mean? That's the whole purpose of the regulation and occupancy right? is so that the county knows what's happening, the village knows what's happening, and ultimately the fire department knows what they're walking into in case of the emergency. Have, have we seen any, any other language from other municipalities about Airbnb? Have we looked at any of that? Have we explored that at all? I mean, because it's, it's like a hot topic, sort of. No, I, no, I don't think the county has anything on it. We haven't checked with your 
I mean, I can try to get I have them. a mask. I can yeah. Answer. Mm -hmm. I would imagine a lot of places are, I mean, especially in like bigger cities, they're having issues, more issues than we would have with it. And we might be able to get some idea of po possibilities that could come up, things that could arise, issues that other places are having. Well, that's yeah. where I got the hotel tax because I was researching it, and the original ones were in San Francisco. Right. And San Francisco required them to register, required that they had insurance, and the agreement was that they had to pay the hotel tax. But it was like San Francisco was like 14%. Um, and they had actually, the people who started it, they fined them for doing something illegally in the community. And what they and they were, and there are other communities that that has happened where they've been fined until it's been dealt with. I think it's some of the, like in New York, that the issue has been because housing is so tight, so there's kind of pressure uh, around the whole Airbnb thing because because uh, you know there's a public uh, need for housing, mm -hmm. so so that's an issue. On the other hand, Airbnb is a great thing. I think in so many ways. So I'm sorry I'm coming in the middle of the conversation. So it's okay. Um, and you know, so well, I mean, I would think that people in town are doing it because to help with affordability and right? to be able mm -hmm. to stay in. I mean, my, my, my one thing still just sort of remains, um, I, just, I just see that like, I mean, I, there's, outside of having to come and get this though, if you have an Airbnb that you can have people stay in your house and make money, people stay in your house with little to no oversight or regulation or anything, I mean, like, after you go through this, there's nothing to, you know, whereas, like to the hotel, all their bed and breakfast, they have, Oh, a lot more things they have to worry about to deal with, like health codes and stuff like that. I mean, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious as to how this could potentially affect you know, people who, who have better breakfast in their house. If there's 200 Airbnbs available, you know, people who can, that can maybe do it cheaper because of this, would that affect? Which is probably a reason then why we would want to regulate. Right, right. You right. know, and at least to have those that are serious about it, you know, go through the processes that they need to go through at the, with the fire marshal. And the right, and I'll just, I, I, I guess I just want the regulation to I mean, sort of resemble what currently stands for people who are doing similar stuff with their houses that aren't, that don't really fit as a short term rental. Um, I mean, and just like in a, uh, you know, with the fairness in mind. Um, that's all. Well, it took me a little bit of time to try to figure out where the whole thing came from in the first place. Um, and so now that we know, it really came out of the, um, so it was actually under uh, Initiative 1, Strengthening the Economy and Revision Good. Statement. Um, and so now that we know it's where it originated from, uh, I can, I need to go back and do a little bit more research on um, how it, you know, what, what the county thinks about it and what, how they would like to see it, you know, if it starts with us, what would they want us to, you know, screen and then, and then if it has to go to our Miami Township Fire and Rescue, that they have to do us some sort of a, an inspection for fire, for a uh, certificate of occupancy. I mean, I'd that would be for us hearing from our citizens first before we go to the county and that sort of thing. Um, I mean, I've really feared a level of bureaucracy that would make it difficult right. for most place people to be able to do it. And um, and in fact, I think a lot of places like our town, not New York City, not San Francisco, small places, uh, which are also places people like to visit, um, there is not very much regulation is my impression and it's kind of been left to be under the radar. Um, I mean, I'd like to look at, like, I, I would rather not go to the county and you know, get all these folks involved in a, in a way that could take the, the, uh, what happens out of our hands, really. Yeah, to be clear, I'm not advocating for more regulation. Um, but I, I guess I just, I'm just trying to understand the, you know, the delineation between this and other forms of, uh, I, 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 I would think that we would want to know, though, where they're operating. Because it seems like you could have some neighborhoods where you could have a whole lot, um, and there might not be parking. I mean, there may be issues in the neighbors. Denise has said she's had some complaints, so it seems like we at least need to know. Well, that's why I was thinking, why don't we hear from folks who've been thinking about it? You know, is there anybody here that wants to comment on it that has information? 
I can comment on it, but it's not um, from a user side. It's really from. Ted, why don't we have you stuck in the phone? Thank you. My name is Ted Donnell. Um, some of the some of the issues really involve some compliance to regular life safety issues. If somebody has an older structure, they don't have fire alarms in them, they don't have smoke detectors in them, they don't have any kind of separation between the residence and that separate usable space, it's a hazard not only to the owner of the property, but the tenant. And if there is a conflict, if there is a fire, if there is a death, God forbid if there is a death, the insurance company will void any, any claim because it's an illegal structure. So we can say that we, you know, we're really loosey-goosey on all of our regulations. <coughs> that doesn't take us outside the scope of what's legal and what's not legal. It just says that we don't care what you guys do. But when we're saying we don't care what you do, we're saying it's all on you. Liability is on you, don't come to us. Well, that doesn't work either because through a court, liability will come to the village. It goes to the county. It goes to me as a licensed professional. So you sued every time there's a problem. You're saying that if we were to have some regulations then that their insurance would then seek it as a legitimate use of the property, yeah. would that be legal and that would be that be covered and wouldn't be the liability wouldn't extend further than the homeowner. Yeah. Uh, and I think the single owner occupancy kind of the concept is really important. Right. You know, you don't want to have people just buying houses and then doing Airbnb and being in Florida. Well, some, I mean, some of the, there's, there's more than one of those in town right now. I think that's exactly. So that's why I was curious about, you know, the... Um, the B&B regulations. Yeah, B&B regulations, right. Yeah. We're, yeah. Because, like, I mean, like, like the... Um, I mean, it's, it's just... I don't know. And in, in other places, too, the bigger cities, like I said, it's like squeezing out other people who have, you know, much stricter regulations and have to do a lot more of upkeep mm -hmm. and have inspections and, you know, have to spend money on things that aren't necessary but are, like, mm -hmm. legally required to... Um, and so I was just, you know, I was just, I was just curious as to how, I mean, how we see those being affected in the future. I mean, I also think we should, whatever we do, language we do come up with, we should take into account, you know, some of these things that might potentially happen in the future, like this pocket neighborhood thing. Could you imagine a pocket neighborhood full of Airbnbs? This, you know, sort of what you're talking about, you know what I mean? It could, you know, end up being something that, you know. So I, I, I mean, maybe we should just continue talking about this and be conscious. I, I, I'd like to look and see what other people are doing in regards to it a little bit. You know, you know, when the zoning code folks were discussing the zoning code changes, one of the issues that came up around change of use and having folks file a change of use or come into the village to get a permit to do something in particular, whether it was a simple, simple matter of just registering with the zoning office and planning office and moving on, going and doing your thing, was so that if I were looking to buy a home in a particular neighborhood, I'd be able to determine, do I have rentals on either side of me? Do I have Airbnbs on either side of me? Where am I moving? What am I buying? Where am I going? Right. That, that it's information for homeowners and people who are moving into the community. Um, that was a primary reason for that push to get a little more regulation at that level. Just that's where that came from initially. So to make to make the use of properties public information, like like a conditional use would you you would know that there was a conditional a business an office a there you know a therapist's office next door in a house etc. Right, so that in a way it yeah. can mitigate some uh, levels of resentment. If I know right. that I'm moving in mm -hmm. next to somebody who's got a business where they might see six or seven clients in a day, I understand uh, yeah. that there will be cars coming and going on a regular basis. I'm aware of that ahead of time. That was the notion. Yeah. Let's let's sort of front end this rather than have issues arise. I I guess my um, push to see what the county re requirements are is so that like that's the really the minimum that people are required. If we have no re regulations, that regul those regulations do apply to them. Um, and at that point, we could decide to put stronger regulations on. That, I mean, I don't want to over-regulate this because I think it's a, a good thing that people should be able to do, but I also see, like, that it hasn't been addressed very thoughtfully in the code yet. 
um, and it's not very clear in the, you know, what the distinction between, I mean, nothing, nothing is about daily rentals, and we should talk more about what, what are the existing requirements for daily rentals legally, and go from there. Yeah, I, I agree with what Rose has said. I would like to see what the the minimal county regulations are, since that's what really people are required. To do. And they may very well not even have any of yes. yeah. this. Yeah. It is pretty new. And I'll also see if I'll try to check on on with some insurance, um, like how that's handled, home ins homeowner insurance policies. Um, I can tell you in terms of the county and the state. And even the international building code, they're all behind. You know, yeah. They're, they're so, but I mean, we so, don't even say daily in our short term rental unit. You don't think they have the word daily? Okay. No one has been renting places daily ever? I mean, well, is that it real? wasn't up until the computer <laughs> and the internet and everyone Google just went to hotels all the time. It would be so hard to do something like I that know, before I all that. Oh, yeah, so I mean, people had people stay at their place, but yeah. nobody was, you know, doing it on it. Basis or yeah. income, right? Yeah. You know, that's where it gets right. I imagine if someone just stays at your house a couple days and they give you some money, that, that, that doesn't count as a business transaction as much yeah. as this. I mean, if I were renting out a bedroom in my house on a daily basis or an hourly basis, I think there would be <laughs> 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 the neighbors would like to know about it. You know? Yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. one of those kinds of things. But, I mean, not necessarily that there's anything wrong happening. <laughs> There are some privacy issues there. If, if strangers are coming to your neighbor's house mm -hmm. and you don't know why, your eyes are open to a circumstance that you were not anticipating when you own the privacy of your own property. And, you know, at that point, you start to question. And the simple purpose of putting it in a system is that the system says we're allowing this and that person and then relax and say, okay, this is regulated. Yes. Otherwise, it becomes eyesight for an illegal activity. And that's when it gets into being a problem to me. I, you know, I think it's easy to get a permit. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's real easy to get things done legally. People don't do it because they just don't want to hassle with it. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, but it's... You know, but that's not true if you're talking about a firewall between the B and Airbnb part of your house, which I heard you talking about. If it's a dump. And, and uh, well, that's what I thought you were saying. I mean, that, yeah. that becomes, that would preclude a lot of people from doing it right there. Sure, yeah. but, there, but the risk is on them. You know, again, if they don't do it, the risk is on them. But that's not a requirement now, and we don't know what the actual now requirements are. So, I mean, right I feel now, like we just if, need if a single more. family home is divided into two separate living units with their own doors. That's a key where people get around. If you, you walk in the main front door, you don't no, have I to I thought you were saying that for Airbnb and most Airbnb places. Are they're, 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 in home. Home. they're not, they're they're not in a second. They're not in a second. Um, you know, but if you create a single family home and create a double, at, you yes, are required. Yeah, I, I appreciate all your information. I'm just saying that I would like to actually have the documentation from the county in front of me next time we talk about that, that's 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 it. Okay. What? I'm sorry. We mentioned briefly about you know talking about you know our ability to have people come forth who already are doing this. You know, I mean, what what's our leeway? What do we have? Well, I mean, I yeah, I've had some. Some complaints. Just like the honor code, essentially, we expect people to do we're doing it, or in the future might be doing it to come forward and do this. Yeah, you know, I mean, I've been in this position now for exactly one year, and, and you know, and I'm just coming around with this whole understanding of this change in use. So, um, you know, nobody has that. I mean, like Ted Tidal said, it's just a change of use can be very simple. But it's not, it's just, it's not even in our, like, no. Well, Springs cultural no. understanding of people need to do that. Right, so I don't, so I'm not surprised that the Airbnbs have popped up and some have called, some haven't. The, the, the two that have called were just thinking about doing it and I couldn't find any regulation that fit. So I just told They them. were thinking of doing daily? 
like a yeah, like the Airbnb thing. And they're probably doing it. Which they may be now, yeah. Yeah, I'll say something about the businesses that Can you not? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> if, I heard you, um, if, you're, if you own a building and you've been renting it to businesses, you do know the rules. You choose to not inform your tenants that they're required to get an occupancy permit. And if in the event, legally, if there is a problem with that tenancy, it still falls on the property owner for liability, yet they still decline to inform their tenants that they have to get an occupancy permit. And some of that has to go with other compliances. Exit lights, emergency lights, um, smoke detectors are a big one. Any kind of life safety thing, size of doorways, ADA compliance, handicapped accessibility compliance. Building owners don't want to have to go through the process of upgrading their building for those simple life safety and accessibility things so they choose to not inform their tenants to get an occupancy permit. And I think that just wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree wholeheartedly, but like, <clears throat> if I wanted to put a room in my house and have someone stay there in Airbnb, I wouldn't think of myself as a business owner or any of that stuff, so I wouldn't think that would even apply to me. Uh, I'm just curious as to like, you know, we could talk about this for months and regulations and all that, but I mean, I think people just aren't gonna do it regardless. And I think, Oh, you're right. and, and also, I mean, like, you go on Airbnb, and Airbnb has a list of rules and things that we have to do and all that, and it's like between private entities, and so people, I mean, I wouldn't even think I would have to come and ask for permission to what I do in my own house, you know, especially because I'm not changing any structures or the use of it doesn't really particularly change, you know, it's still, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, the only way is, is that, it, that it's going to come to our attention is if it's advertised. And so you somebody, somebody brings it to our attention. Yeah, it's usually going to be a neighbor, right. and it's usually about parking. Yeah. And, and that's, how, that's how a lot of things from here anyways. I yeah. that, but, but I, mean, I, I just wanted to, yeah, to, to, you know. Mm. Well, on the Airbnb side, uh, and whether or not this number is accurate, because I wondered if it was also including outside of Yellow Springs, but it says 119 in Yellow Springs. What? Huh? 119. Wow. Now, there were, you know, and I didn't look at all of them, I was just looking at some of them. And a number of them are uh, bed and breakfast that are registered as bed and breakfast. That are just, I'm sure, using that as a uh, way to reach more people. But it says, you know, <laughs> it's off 119 in Yellow Springs. Well, and we'll have to look at that. Well, we'd have, like I said, we'd have to look at that because <clears throat> I have people calling all the time to get um, zoning information, then, and they, and it's Yellow Springs. But it's outside the village. Exactly. And also, that site might have a 20 mile And that's where so like a high down the road is yellow. I was still seeing it. Yeah. That's, that's a lot. That's more, I, I would have guessed 30. Parts of Bath Township, this still say yellow. Okay. So, so we want to ask for people who are doing it to, I mean, to have a public discussion. I mean, I know it was one. Yeah, this is a public discussion, but I'm just saying we want to actually make a little more outreach in terms of the people. What about, what about, about coming? Well, we might not want to hear that. <laughs> what about what them coming to Denise, like in a more the same way? Right? Right. Yeah, I don't even but, hear. I mean, I think I think like could. Could you reach out to people, you know, or put an ad in the paper? Is that what you're suggesting, Judith? What are you suggesting exactly? Like an invitation to a meeting. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Which I think would be a bad idea. I think that's a great idea. Really, yeah. really there's a hundred people. So have a, have a planning commission meeting yeah. with a place on the agenda for this discussion yeah. and invite some of these yeah. that I've already talked to and I said we do, don't have regulations that we are, on it. That we I mean, if we don't have regulations do on it, right, like they should be informed what the regulations are at the county level and, um, you know, like... So I think we need to first have maybe one more go around yeah. Yeah, before yeah. we do that. Get some yeah. research done of like, you know, yeah. what the county okay. regulations are and all that stuff yeah. and then talk yeah. again. I think, I think that's great. And I, I would definitely like the, you know, the definition of what a bed and breakfast is, like as part of this discussion okay, yes. as well. Uh, and does that mean you need to? Yeah. It's 
some of our folks involved here are already involved. Okay. Okay. Do we want to now move on to um, pocket neighborhoods? Sure. And we have a couple of items that were included on our packet. Can you talk yeah. About well, I, I have to be honest with you. I've, I've, I've done a little bit of research on it, but I, to go in, in depth with it, I didn't have the opportunity to with every with all these other things that were on the agenda tonight. Um, but uh, I, you know, uh, Ted now who's still here happened to bring this to us and then um, he had provided a, a document, I don't know that, that, that was in your packet before, and since that time I found a uh, Lehigh Valley Planning Commission had a model ordinance for what they call cottage housing and then going further into that I actually found an example of what a pocket neighborhood zoning code might look like um, which gets into like the minimum setbacks the, the number of dwelling units um, <clears throat> but I but getting into the nitty-gritty of it I had have not I Uh, well, on the, uh, you know, I just want to comment on the, uh, I looked at the model ordinance, the cottage housing development. I really liked that. You, you, I think I, I thought that did a very nice job, and I thought it um, just was very nice. The sample zoning code, uh, I did question B, that it has a minimum track size of four acres, and I think we certainly wouldn't want that. I think the model one talked about if you could even have, like, two lots, two adjoining lots, because the size is what four to twelve units. Well, and, 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 and we need to look at that too. I yeah. mean, you know, you have this uh, cottage housing concept that Antioch College is considering, yeah. um, you know, which has a lot more units than that. Mm -hmm. You know, so we might want to up the number of units. Up the number. Yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't get a chance to read through this as thoroughly as I would like to. Um, maybe did we speak to the density, the number of density at all? What would we read? Well, that, yeah, I don't. Would we be changing, like, would, would this fit under, like, I mean, RC would be a separate uh, zoning zone completely, or? It would need to be. Or, like, PD, would it be a PD? Or no, we're saying that this is, would sort this of. This would be in its own little chapter. Within. Because the PD has not really been um, u useful in the way that it was designed, that, that we thought it would be. This is what you said pretty much when we talked about it last, right? That this is an alternative to the PUD that would be more useful to what the intention of the PUD was. Like a more applicable PUD. Well, as I, understood, as I understood it as well, that you know, you have the PUD, and as I recall from the conversation, it was to be the exception, not the rule, when it comes to things that don't fit quite in the zoning code as it is. Right. And this would be a place for things to fit. That yeah, yeah. so that you're not you're not having all these different PUDs and each one has different requirements yeah. and then and then zoning has to try to regulate and re recall that. So if I had to fight uh, some property and I wanted to develop this on I would have to get a result. It, it, it's, I, to I, was just, I, was just I mean, if you had a property and you wanted to get, build a lot of units on, you would have to, if it didn't fall within what's allowed lot, already, right. then, more than then more. you would have to rezone it as a PUD, and that's our only option right now is the PUD. Right, right. So would we have to rezone it to pocket neighborhood or no? Yes. 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 So, it'd be another so that zone. would be required. It, would, it, it would wouldn't be something that would be allowed in different um, neighborhoods. It could be allowed in all neighborhoods. It, it would be. So would it require then a zoning change? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it, because it, can you just take that animal. darn okay. Okay. Yeah, just sit, sit down. down. Okay. It's, it's <laughs> Stand up, sit down, Ted. What it does is, even in our highest density zoning, 
we still talk about single family residences mm -hmm. and or we go to multi-family residences and we don't have anything that separates like um, it consolidates cars to a right. single area it doesn't allow us to have more pedestrian ways and common space areas we don't have anything in our zone in our zoning code that, that allows that and i think that this this concept is something that's very des desirable in Hills Springs. Yes. And you know, I've been trying to do this for 20 years and just can't find the, the land to do it necessarily. You know, and I've kind of been ahead of the time a little bit, but um, it, it, to change the zoning and to go through the PUD process is just agonizing. Mm -hmm. it, it's agonizing. It took me two years to get um, Glenside done in the Alpharas, you know, and it was just a simple plat, and we compromised a lot, and it's a beautiful little plat, all the density's there, you know, but it, it was, it was just agonizing. So this would make the process a lot easier. So it's like, yeah. let's agonize all kinds over. Of stuff that wouldn't be necessary in this, you know, it requires a lot of that. Because yeah. you have to, you have to go over everything on a PD. this would be, change it to this, these are the requirements. Yeah, yeah. check off all these things. Period. Yeah. And the other thing it does is it, it, you know, the zoning code on some level um, is a reflection of the community values. And we worked real hard on that when we redid the zoning code. You know, the pocket neighborhood, cottage community concept, co-housing things, those are new. You know, even before the zoning code was rewritten or we would have stuck them in there. Um, Why don't we just stick them in there? Why well, don't we trying. change the well, zone? No, I mean, instead of making people rezone, like, could we change all the residential zones, just change the requirements and let this be allowed there? It would be, you couldn't void out what's already there. No, I'm, what's, what's already where? If, uh, residence A zone mm -hmm. is already defined by single family residences with certain minimum size lots, setbacks. Yeah, density. but we changed that. That's what we do. I mean, well, but, but you, if, if you propose to allow the densities of a cottage community within the existing residential zones, it would be illegal. Because you can't, the property values and everything that everybody bought into that community with would be dramatically affected if somebody stuck you know, I own an acre on Allen Street. I'm just saying that out because it's, it's what sticks in my head. Somebody owns an acre on Allen Street and somebody bought the property next door and all of a sudden put a pocket neighborhood in there of 20 units, that person would lose their mind in what we allow to have happen adjacent to their property. And I'm not saying that. But they would, come, they would be able to come to a zoning code the pocket changing to a pocket neighborhood zone and be like, no, I'm not like this. That would make people happy though, you know. Yeah, if, so if we had a pocket neighborhood zoning ordinance and we had that in defined in our zoning code as an option in any neighborhood, then it would have to go for planning commission but in a public But what community. if it was conditional use in, say, like well, some of the residential... It would have to be rezoned. There's other like... I mean, and, and I'll say this, if you have, if, if a neighborhood is designed for certain size lots, the water service, the sewer service, um, are and the road size are all sized to that density, that spread out density. If you change so, the way well, they I, something to account every time someone would want to come and get rezoned. Yeah. But what I'm that's, saying is, that's what we would do if this was conditionally allowed in some of the zones, instead of changing the zone i i'm i'm willing to admit that i might be wrong and you might be right i'm just i'm just trying to you know like think about like it why is that not a better option to create you know create the regulations but instead of creating a new zone that would be spot zoned right um, apply these regulations as a new conditional use within some of our other zones. I think that would I, be if, the, the only thing I could see 
with the idea of having the two steps with the rezoning first. It allows the neighbor, neighbors, if they have an issue with it, before you're asking someone to come and spend all this money with a complete plan. You know, when you, when you come for a conditional use, you have a site plan <coughs> review and there's a preliminary site plan and there's, but if you can't even get it zoned, if you have that step first, if you can't even get it zoned, then you stop. Wouldn't you need all of those things to get it zoned? No, you wouldn't. You'd have to get it rezoned to a PUD or, in this case, this pocket. Yeah, but you wouldn't need a plan to get it rezoned into a pocket neighborhood. You're saying the the the, the overview that I wouldn't think you'd have to go through all that you, that, that entire process. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess my only, I mean, I... So it would be easier than, than having a conditional use hearing. No, you... So it could be harder for the end user to get this process done if we have the rezone and the conditional use. And but I, I, I'm just curious, like the difficulties, is it worth it? the benefits? Are is it worth the extra difficulty, or just the like the prevention of like liability, whatever it is? Um, I mean, the conditional route seems route seems to be a good way to to, to handle to handle it. I think. I, I mean, I don't think that I think the pocket neighborhood ordinance. Would, so just like the PUD, you still, if you still have to rezone, you just keep that process the same. But I think the difference between the PUD and the pocket neighborhood is it has some sort of uh, maximum standards for what you can do in the pocket neighborhood, um, whereas the PUD, you're doing completely different, and that takes a much longer process. Yeah. that a person has to go through it. Yeah. This would cut that time down. Sure. Yeah, you're right. I'm sold on that. Yeah, I'm sold on the whole thing. So, I understand the conditional use versus the making a whole new zone. So it's this it's proposal is so that it could be done in, like, residence A. Okay. A question I have that are all of these the ones that you've seen, do they all require, it sounds like there's so much that everything has to be so similar. You know, like porches on all the houses. Yeah, I don't. I think that that's one of the rewrites that we would do. Okay. You know, there I could be some differences. Did, I personally would even take it to the other side and say they shouldn't look like. Yeah. Where yeah. Was. You know, I mean, the cottage communities that I designed are all individual, so it's very eclectic. And and then this one you provided, that was the complaint of some of the neighbors that they didn't like it because then, they were all just alike. Yeah, like a little suburb. Yes. Right. Yes. And that was a concern that I had that you might not, you know, everybody might not want the same. You might have some that are one level so they're handicap accessible. You might want some that are two story, um, just a variety. Yeah. Any other comments? Okay. So, who goes through this and makes a draft that is? actually applicable to Yellow Springs? Who, who's job? Like, I mean, I'm going to try to take a stab at it. I was, it's just, so yeah, but then you would like bring that language here. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, you would bring it to us and then we would, or, and then we would give you recommendations on, you know, edits on that, or should we bring edits, should we email edits to you now? What's the, I think what I would do is start with the basic premise. You know, there's always a purpose for each zoning section. There's a purpose for that zoning section. Start with that purpose and take some examples, Denise, out of what you found and bring those to a meeting. If this stretches out six months, who cares? Nobody yeah. pushing to do this right at the moment. But that would then at least get things focused to then go to the, when you go to the next step and talk about density or you talk about you know all the sections that are applicable to that zoning ordinance then it's going to kind of keep it manageable and focused on one topic every meeting what is what is the problem that this tries to solve is there right now we don't if we wanted to do a tiny house community we can't do it 
we could do it in the PUD. Yeah, we could do it in the PUD. But so much work. But the PUD is is unique every single time. This would be standardized. That's the the PUDs are a lot of work. And it's spot zone. And we don't want a PUD is almost impossible to administer, especially over changes in ownership. This you know, would whereas be. Whereas if you have a zoning district or its own within a zoning code, you know what it is by legislation. And then that's encouraged as you know a community value, really. And I think that you know as a cottage community is very, very much in keeping with what we're trying to do here, mm -hmm. you know, as a community. I just see it being a good fit. So if we allow it and we encourage it, you know, a developer comes in and says, I want to do a tiny house community or something, we have legislation that says that we're permitting you to do it. Here's how to go about it, this is what we want it to look like. You know, that's being way ahead of the curve. So, you know, that's why I, I'm seeing it a lot. So I, I, that's the thing. I, one of the reasons that I was thinking about, instead of having this as a separate town, is if there was existing buildings that had a plan, you know, around them that wanted to expand or, you know, like change the parking and, do, you know, we just, we don't have very much just open land for a cottage community, like bringing back the changing, having conditionally allowed um, density relief, sort of like more density allowed in existing zones is, is what I was thinking that might be possible if, um, instead of this being a separate zone. Uh, that's just one of my thoughts. And does, does rezoning, the last was the BZA, right? Those are the planning commission. Rezoning. Oh, rezoning with previous planning commission. Planning commission, oh, all right. No, I, was, I, was I mean, it goes all the way through council. So right, well, yeah, I was just curious about like BZA thing, I know they don't mean, you know, regularly, it might be something. Um, that's why it would be, I can see a difference for conditional use versus a new zone, but otherwise I would see. I guess I did one more. It seems to me that if, if we're going to think about like a tiny house community, then much and you know a whole neighborhood, that's fine. But are we going to make it possible also for tiny houses to dot about throughout the village? Not in this particular. I mean, not that I would be for. If we're going to take do that, we should take that next step as well because there's a lot of smaller pieces of land throughout the village that potentially, you know, at this point, the only way this tiny house can happen is associated with a bigger house, or, you know what I mean? That's, you know, and sort of. That's not true. No, that's what? not true. Well, there's they a lot of restrictions on, I mean, the restrictions on the amount of land, et cetera, would make it, I think, or yeah, would, would have to be a bigger piece. Well, you right? know, that's according to the zoning code, if you have what you're calling it like a non-conforming lot that doesn't fit our smaller, yeah. yeah, if that house meets all the setbacks for that area, they can still go ahead. If it, the lot is tiny enough, could, could you make your lot but smaller? The the, <laughs> I was going to say, can it? I mean, well, don't the houses have to be a certain size, though? Yeah, if they're, they're small, small, like if they're small, they'll have to be There, 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 isn't there used to be regulations in the zoning code about size, yeah. uh, but that, that's not in the zoning code. Right. What about the, well, it's the it's building on not in the Zinia zone. Avenue that had to, the tiny, the tiny, the smaller unit was built first with special permission because a larger house was going to be built. Oh, that's well, no, that's right. well, yeah. Oh, we do have something that you can't have an accessory structure built first and then no, but there. I thought the why was that? <laughs> uh, but why was it? I mean, wasn't it not allowed as a standalone property? Like because it was so small? Yeah, there, it's no. Okay, I remember. That. So, there were there, if you go back to the zoning code before the zoning code, we don't have size. There is minimums. Okay. I mean, there is uh, 800 square feet or seven. It's in there. It's not in the zoning code. We didn't know that. Now, yeah. why it's not in the zoning code, I don't know. Sure? It's not in the zoning code. Now, now I just found today uh, under chapter 12. 
chapter 14, um, which is not in the zoning, but it's in housing. There's minimum housing standards, mm -hmm. and it says a dwelling unit for one person must be at least 150 square feet. If you add a second person, another 100 square feet. Um, what? Uh, yeah, those, those I just found this in another section, so I actually emailed it. That's an Ohio building. Yeah, that, yeah. and that's why it's there. Yeah, it's Ohio building. But there's nothing, for some reason, that whatever was in that zoning code before is not in here now. So I, I don't know. I know that in, in looking in, uh, people were talking about it, that people were talking about not having those standards. But I don't, I don't know why it's not in there. I mean, it's just not in there. Whether that was oversight, an error in the code, because there's been so many, as you all know. Even, even, like, even in the words like where it lays out like the zone, the restrictions that was allowed. Yeah, no, dimensional requirements. I can, I can swear that, no, it's not there. That lot that we talked about on the day of the street for the, the home make lot, I can swear that when I looked that up, there was one of the issues we had was there is number of units per acre. For, well, yeah, yeah, but not density, the size of them. I can swear that we had an issue with the number of units we wanted to do. We have we have to get us get something because the setbacks would be right with the square footage that was the minimum requirement or something like that. I could swear there was something Well, like that what, was what it says is um, if you, if you, if you have um, a lot and you want to have two, uh, two things on it, like double, you have to have out of that lot size, you have to have a square footage of, 40, of like 4,000 or 4,500 square right. feet for each one that you're adding. Right. So I understand that. I just thought it was. But I mean, as far as the house itself, right. the, the size of the house itself, it used to be in the old zoning code. It's not in here anymore. Right. Wait, what about, but it says for your calling units, there's like the, the percentage of the larger house. Mm -hmm. Is that the minimum that it has to be? No, not. No, so I just found under minimum yes. housing standards, okay. which is something totally different. Okay. Your primary structure, I literally just found this today, so I haven't like read through it all, but it just said a dwelling unit for one person, 150 square feet, and then add another person 100 square feet, and it was adding like other rooms and stuff, and it was like 75 square feet if you add this. Huh, yeah, and I haven't had a chance to really look at it, but I just found that today. That came out of the Ohio you know, residential. Oh, okay. And see, the reason I didn't find it is because it's called building and housing, and I was looking at her building for months, and, and it just goes, see Ohio Revised Code, blah, blah, blah. And everything, it didn't have any standards. And then it wasn't until the day I happened to go further down, like in the appendixes, and then all of a sudden I saw that. I was like. The honey house movement is growing with kids again for the building code. I mean, I can yeah. you know, it's very difficult for the, it is very, you think it's hard to change our zone code. You ought to try to change your building code. I mean, it's got to go through an international level now for compliance because all states adopt the international building code. Each Wait. state then, <laughs> I'm sorry, each state then breaks off and adds constraints within the international building code. Mm -hmm. right. And so it's real difficult. I mean, and so they're always behind. You know, when we talk about, talk to the county about what the regulations are on things that are new to the table. Yeah. They're 10 years. So it, it's possible that whatever we say we be or allow the county to then 10 years from now catch up and say, no, you can't do that. We have to change what we're right. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the county, the state building code supersedes the county right. local. But so, and, and there are minimum standards. I mean, yeah. you know, it's not like the building code is difficult. To yeah. And are, are there, I mean, do you know if there's any state building code standards about the sizes of, you know, only in what the, the, long 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 the, the only difference, uh, though, is where we do have regulations is if, it, if that tiny house is built on a chassis uh, where it can be moved. You can't right. you know, you can, you can, you can do the mobile home at all right now. Anything that's done no. I mean, it has to be on the foundation. We do have zoning regulations and, and on that. As far as the foundation goes, that's the like court foundation. Like Oh, I mean, there's places in town that have the, yeah, like, just yeah. the, the... So it could be a house that you could then 
put put on something um, but you can't have them on wheels and no, can't be on something you can hook up and move when they come consider that we can we in our code consider it like a recreational vehicle. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else on pocket neighborhoods? I'll so, look into some more. Okay. okay. I'd like a, a outline, you know, like even if you don't fill in the numbers, just an outline of the, the parts that it would have. Yeah, and you said that you've, you've, you've yeah. designed some of these before, obviously, right? But, I mean, it, 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 is there any way that we can see some of those? I mean, like, just anything Examples. from that? Example plans, even, or? Um, or do you have a website that you can look at? The ones that I'm doing right now are all going through zoning issues. Right. So they're, I mean, it, the one in particular that I'm working on that seems to be leading the pack is one in Bandale. Okay. And, yeah. All Vandalia says is no. <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it is such, and I, it, it, they laugh at me because I use Yellow Springs as an example of a community that permits things that are, you know, out of the box. And, you know, their comments are like, yeah, you know, and it's so, insulting. I mean, you know, it's like, I'll take Yellow Springs any day over a place like, you know, no, <laughs> yeah, and this one, this particular one is, um, it's for veterans. Okay. So, and it's not for veterans that are within the system. So right. These are the fringe guys and yeah. girls that, you know, need help but won't seek help because the system is just so bad. Right. And it's a way to have a multi-generational place that's quiet and each individual cottage is either the smallest is 600 square foot, the biggest is 800 square foot. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've read a lot, read a lot about pocket neighborhoods in regards to like, you know, how they would be, you know, laid out like that. I was just curious, like, you had like the, just the issues that you weren't into in other zones, zoning codes. That's Every, that. Well, see, all of the other zone, all the zoning codes are just are similar to ours in that they have a district. You know, if you're in the are a district, your density has to be a certain thing, then the thing that I run into is not so much the density, it's the house size, mm -hmm. which we took out intentionally, yeah. by the way. Right. You know, it's the size of the unit. Right. And they won't let me put a smaller unit in combination on these lots. They, you know, it's got to be Why? Hard because there it is. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about the size is you can't put like, tenement housing everywhere, so you have like standards of living that are like somewhat acceptable, but like that's now those those kinds of rules were instituted when that was much more of a problem than this would be now. And also and people were more blessed. Right. right. Okay. Um, you beat it, that into the ground, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> are, are we ready maybe to move on so that Denise is going to try to work on something for us? Yeah, I just want to say that um, <clears throat> this has really been a very busy summer and I have had five more permits that came across my desk today. I, I don't know what's going on, but it's just been a work on this office. office. And, and I have big things on the horizon. Yeah. Okay. I've got a couple big things coming from Home Inc. I've got uh, a very, very big thing coming from Antioch. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, I will do my best. And sure. you know, I really could hope maybe, you know, after September, maybe a lot of the contractors will stop. <laughs> and, you know, they've gotten everything they can get in before winter, right. you know, but I don't know. So it may be a couple months. It may be, I mean, yeah, I'll definitely, okay. I'll definitely, you know, yeah. I want to, you know, keep, keep, keep it, it going right, and, right. I can, and, and try to resolve the Airbnb as well. But I mean, yeah. Do we have any other new business? Oh, I did have, oh, that's Jen planning, sorry. And no. And so for agenda planning. Yeah, we're gonna have a couple more text amendments. Um, the right of way. Yeah, the right of way vacation procedure. This, this section twelve twenty four is not in the zoning code, but I came across it and it still had the old fee, and it, it wasn't caught when the planning commission back in two thousand fifteen changed the fees. Okay. Okay. It was right of way vacation is in the <coughs> section. And um, dimensional requirements, residential districts, um, Board of Zoning Appeals found that oh, we found, I had to have somebody come for a 
BZA hearing and, and it was pretty much concluded by the Board of Zoning feels that that was another error in the code. Okay. And How long did that before? Was that? It was, it was a BZA meeting. It was a, um, you have a setbacks in the residential. I'll just show it to you real quick what I'm talking about. Um, Um, in residential districts, you have um, <clears throat> side yard setbacks, um, which previously, in past times, you had a total of 10, and then it went up to 15, and then in RA, the, the, the south side town, it would go up to 20, um, with the lease being 10 uh, on the up side. To 20 feet. 20, to 20 total, so basically 10 on each side okay. for a side setback. For some reason in RA, it's 25. It, it went up, to, it, was, it jumped from 15 to 25, which doesn't even, isn't even the norm even in our, in residential A. What does, I'm sorry, what for does side mean? Uh, where you place your house, yeah. you have to be at least 10 feet from the other property owner. Okay, do you have to be 25 feet from? You total 25. That's so weird. It's oh, weird, so you have to be on both sides. So you have to be 10 feet from? So on each side. Um, yeah, so 10 so, being the minimum. So you could be like 10 on one side and 15 on the other. You had to be 15 on the other. Yeah, you'd be limited. You yeah, had it didn't to be make any sense. As long as the minimum is 10. You could 10. be 10 on one side and 10 on the other. Which is what it should be, right. yeah. Okay. And that's how it had to be for. And they think, and they're pretty sure um, all of the BCA members that were uh, Steve Kahn and so the uh, 20, so they were all for 25 is the thing that's is wrong. You need to change okay. to 20. Yeah. Yep. And so that will be our next meeting. <coughs> yeah. And you should have a, a draft mowing ordinance that um, council had requested that the Environmental Commission propose something in that regard and bring it back to planning commission for the or next meeting to review no. or is, is it has to go it would be okay. at your next meeting no okay. giant rush but given the ordinance process you want to have it in place by march of next year or you've lost another year on moment right and this is coming from the, the environmental commission you said it's yeah. coming from council yeah oh, from council well council directed environmental commission to look into it and directed them to bring it to planning okay. commission so that you need to actually come from planning commission to, to council okay. as a so what was the discussion about what was the concern yeah mowing what was the concern mowing some people were upset their neighbors aren't mowing uh, okay so but that was one more regulation so. <laughs> right now you don't have to mow because it's not there okay. nesting Creatures, oh, so right. I don't have to mow until right. next day, and there were complaints yeah. regarding that. So, July 1st, yeah, it is July 1st, like the end of August, it's a very really short period of time. You okay, have to uh, do we have anything else then? Okay, then can we get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? Second. Okay, we are everybody in agreement? Yes? Yes. <laughs> we're adjourned. I was enjoying myself. <laughs> 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 <laughs>